We got some exciting stuff for you folks today. We got several operators here in, a pieces, of, in pieces of equipment. We're going to go through uh, some of our, our different pieces of equipment and talk about efficiencies and how these machines can help uh, that operator out in the field. So we're going to kick back, relax, and watch our demonstrator instructors go forward and uh, tell us a little bit about what they're doing here. So with that, John Hood, take it away. Yeah, Nathan, thanks. Um, what I got here for you is I got a couple different slots set up. Um, we're kind of going to do right way, wrong way, or as some people do call it. Um, we're going to start back to front, technically wrong way, but we're going to start with this one first and kind of show you a few of the inefficiencies uh, that kind of take place when you're doing it this way. Because a lot of times you get on a job site and they say, move this dirt from here to here, get it over there, stockpile it, right? So typically they always start where they say, hey, we need to start right here and start moving the dirt. So as you can see, I kind of already got these uh, pre-dug and started. Um, so I would have dozed all this out, working my way forward to the direction I'm going. So I'm going to get to it, and I'm going to start cutting some material here. So I'm, I'm down on my slot, and I'm cutting in the bottom, and I'm pushing uphill. So that's one of the biggest inefficiencies about this is you're not using that uh, gravity to your advantage, right? So I'm pushing uphill, which... You know, there's a lot of things that take place. You get a lot of track slippage. It's just going to be more wear and tear on the machine. And honestly, it's for an operator, it's harder to cut this way, right? Um, so some things you want to keep in mind when you're setting up a job or you're preparing for your job. <coughs> so I'm going to come up here and I'm going to drop this material. Kind of the same, uh, dropping the material, maintaining the same slope as I would um, if I was doing a, a, a slot when I was going from front to back. So... Right now, we're in, back, we're in the uh, back to front mode. We're trying to cut uphill. As you can see, again, I'll start in the bottom. I'm gonna work my way up top. And if you flip over the camera, uh, Jeff, you can kind of see the, the slopes and stuff I'm working on by the machine display. Um, especially whenever I get up here to the uh, spoil pile. That's one thing, no matter what you're doing, you always wanna kind of maintain a good spoil pile. You don't want your slope going up that spoil pile to be so shallow that it's drawn out real far but you don't want to be so steep to where you can't really climb it efficiently right it's you're losing a lot of more of the dirt down at the end um, as you're climbing up that toe but it's just uh, an example of a way, one of the ways that isn't very efficient to do it now I'm going to jump over here to this other side this is one of the more efficient ways to move material and this application here, you can see I'm about three quarters to a full blade depth. Um, you don't want to get much more than that because um, then you can have cave offs, um, material falling onto the machine, or if you do have to get out of the machine, um, there's a little bit more of a safety hazard there. So as you can see, I'm starting back. I'm using gravity to my advantage. I'm loading the blade up. You see the material pulling off. And then once I load that blade up, I'm going to carry in second gear. So I'm still going to carry my material. Again, once I get to my toe, I got my slope I'm set to about a three to one. Um, it takes a minute for the for the numbers to climb, but pretty close. You don't want it too steep of a slope. And you don't want too uh, shallow of a slope as you're doing your slot. But So, John, John, when you were doing this, I know you, you, we started this uh, slot like halfway through uh, for, for demonstrations purposes, but the very first thing you would have done is your first push right up by that first cone up there, correct? Working from front to back? Yep, so when you're, when you're doing this, you can see this ground's pretty hard here, but when you're, when you're doing front to back, you always want to start where the end of your cut is or where the toe of your spoil pile is going to be and work your way backwards, right? So, again, you can see... I cut going downhill using the weight of the machine, using gravity. And now the main, the big thing about this is you're keeping all that material in front of your blade. You're using the, the walls of your slot to kind of hold that material in front of the blade. That way, whenever you carry it through the cut, you're not losing a bunch off to the sides. You're not spilling a lot of material off to the sides. So that's another big efficiency to this. Um, one more thing I want to talk about. Whenever I go back and do my uh, next cut is blade steer. So some of the guys they get in the habit of always using their diff, diff steer to kind of adjust themselves while they're in the cut, while they're under load, right? So you really don't want to turn the machine while you're under load. Um, 
it's a lot harder on the drive train, a lot harder on the transmission. So as I back up, I'll load the blade up again. I think I should have ripped this material up a little bit more. It's a little hard there, Nathan. Now you're but doing a great job out there. Loading the blade up. As you load the blade up, downhill, again, if you start drifting, if you angle the blade a little bit one direction, whatever direction you need to go, it's going to actually pull the machine that direction. So I'm not putting that hard wear and tear on my drivetrain by using my diff steer. I'm able to tilt my blade one direction or the other, and it's going to naturally pull the machine to that direction. So that's kind of a good tip for the whole wear and tear um, things on the powertrain because if these machines aren't running, we're not making money, right? So it's kind of our paycheck. So, John, that was some good information that you, you gave to the group here. So just to recap, on you know, the far side, the first slot he was in was technically the wrong way. And typically we see this out, happen out a lot on some job sites and where you start at the very back and you work your way forward and you're again as john was talking you're pushing uphill uh with the right way he was in he's he's able to push downhill uh, using gravity and the weight of the machine to help get uh, that blade loaded and then using the efficiency of those sidewalls and going forward john if you want to explain real quick you know this can be used not only just when you're bulk earth moving but in just some even lighter applications correct yeah, that's for sure. So you're stripping six inches of topsoil or ten inches, whatever it may be. Get that first slot started. Start from front to back. Work your way back, and then uh, using those windrows, even though they're only you know a foot, two feet tall, using those windrows to uh, help capture and keep whatever materials in front of your blade. Um, um, it helps you be more efficient. So and that's the big thing about that is always thinking ahead, always wondering if you could do it better, if you could be more efficient. All right. Well, thank you for that, John. And, and for the group, you know, as John's talking about efficiency, one of the worst things you can do in a dozer is back up. So anytime we have reverse, uh, you know, that, that wears out that undercarriage, too. And so that's that's one of the reasons we're doing uh, uh, that, that front-to-back method, which helps it out. So with that, we're going to transition over to our excavator. we got Keith Lilly in the 320, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of our best practices uh, and some of the technology that we can use when we're bench loading. So, Keith, how about it? Sure, Nathan. Um, so one of the first things when we're bench loading material, um, number one, it's the most efficient way to move bulk material when you're using excavators and trucks. Uh, number one, it, the lift you have, you don't have to go all the way down below ground, all the way up above ground to get your material loaded into trucks. So normally we try and make benches on jobs just to stockpile material and, uh, like I say, to make it easier to move and load the material. So the first thing I want to look at when I'm building a bench is, number one, how much swing I'm, uh, for the excavator I have so I can make sure that I cover both sides without having to come down one side and back the other. Um, it all depends on room, of course, but uh, another one is the height. So if you look, I have my bucket on the ground. <coughs> um, so we would take basically the pin where the bucket pins to the stick, the distance from there to where the, the uh, stick pins to the boom. So if this is a 10-foot stick, I would want a 10-foot tall bench. That's where our ideal uh, range is for our horsepower and for our productivity. So this is this is a uh, our ideal spot. Like you say, some sometimes we get a little taller, sometimes we get a slower. But for the most efficient, uh, this is where we want for our height. So whichever excavator we have, whether it's a mass axe or a long stick, whichever, um, that's what we need to do is make sure that our, our bench height is crucial when it comes to actually making very, very high production. So we'll go ahead and pull the truck in here, and we're going to set him into what's called a drive-by. Uh, drive-by or uh, over the bed, over the rear, over the gate, however you'd like to call it. But um, So what this is, what I'm doing here is I'm getting him set up at about a 90-degree angle for me. So if you look at my excavator, you'll see that my tracks are indexed at about a 45 degrees to the pile. What that does is allows the most stable footing for the excavator. Uh, if I was sitting completely sideways, perpendicular with the pile, what would happen is if it would cave off or slough off, uh, I really have no way of controlling the machine without just putting my, my uh, bucket in the bed of the truck or uh, actually falling off the pile. And if they're completely the other way, then every time I have to move, I have to back up, turn, reset, back up, turn, reset. This way here, I can just back up turn just a little bit, come back up, re-index, and off we go. 
So one of the other things that I'm doing with my digging process is going from the front of the truck, starting there filling it, and then working my way to the back. Um, in the same turn, when I'm at the pile, I'm working from the farthest to the closest. So basically what that's doing is the, the more full that I get the truck, the better, uh, the less swing time I have. So the less swing time we have, uh, of course, better productivity, right? So with that being said, digging technique is another one. So I want to start my cut with my machine just far enough away to where I'm about a 75 degree to 90 degrees with my stick. So when I go into the pile, I'm going to start at about 75 with my bucket about 30% or 30 degrees uh, with angle. And then by the time I get to 90 degrees, my bucket's full. I don't really have to use a whole lot of bucket um, uh, input. So the bucket's kind of basically going to fill itself. So as we come back, I'll drop down another uh, foot or so with this material. Just stick in. That's where we got all our power. Most breakout force. Cradle the material. Want to have 100 to 110 percent fill factor with this material here. It's pretty light. So as we keep going, like I say, we kind of keep clean as we go. So we'll go ahead and have Ben. I'll put one more on him, and we'll have him come back around, and we'll show you another uh, digging or another uh, loading technique that we use with the trucks. How we can set them up just a little bit different. And while he's coming around, I'll show you guys some payload. So what I've done on this machine is I've set up on our Cat Next Gen excavators that come standard with our payload. Um, so on this payload, if you guys can see the screen, what I've done is I've named our truck, I've named our material, I've set my target. My target is 35 tons, 35 ton haul truck, which typically we wouldn't be loading with a 320. We want to keep, you know, somewhere in that six pass range for an excavator and truck match. But what I've done is set this up. So it tells me how many buckets I put on the truck, and tells me how many tons I put on the truck, and tells me how many, how much per bucket I'm getting, and then my target. So putting all that together, that tells me, okay, it's taking me X amount of buckets to fill this truck, and I know that right now 320 is not the ideal uh, machine to be loading the 735 with. And it also tells me that my material is a little bit light because of clay, I should be a little bit heavier than two, um, two ton per bucket. But on another good thing about this is it allows me to track the excavator, the operator, um, knowing just who's on the machine at what time, and, and allows me to uh, keep track of all my tonnage. So if I have to switch material, say I'm billing per ton, I can switch material, keep track of that, and then at the end of the day, I can go right into the monitor, um, right into the monitor, and there's a spot where it says save, and I can pop a USB drive in there, and it downloads all my all my weights uh, per truck, per material, everything. So I'm going to let Ben go. And then basically once I'm done with him, all I have to do is push a button on my stick. It saves that. So now it's stored it, and away we go. So now I have that. It's stored in the machine. And like you say, also, if I want to go back to it, I can also put it, pull it and put it on a USB drive, keep track of it on my computer at home or in the office or wherever I need to. So, but yeah, that's part some of our, like you say, some of our great efficiencies. That's also some of our, uh, some of the uh, payload features that we have on these machines. Anyway, all right. Well, thank you for that, Keith. Yeah, that that was some. We can figure out a way to get that truck down below the excavator. Uh, we're going to be able to the sling dirt like like nobody's business and be able to be productive at the end of the day. So, thank you again for that, Keith. I know we got some more information coming up on that that machine here in a little bit, but we're going to transition over to the dozer. So we got John Hood back in a, a D6 XC. So he's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, efficiencies of. Work no, I do get quite a bit is, you know, how steep or how how steep is a safe slope? Like, or when is it too steep to be dangerous, right? So there's a lot of things that come into play with that. A big one is the material you're working on, right? Your underfoot conditions. That's that's probably about the biggest um, biggest setback on what kind of slope you can uh, you can work, not only up and down, but side to side. So and you want to work from the top down, right? Again, using gravity. Um, Gravity is your friend, so using gravity with you. Anytime you can do from top down, that's always the best thing to do. Um, but building a slope in general, working from 
working perpendicular up and down that slope is is going to be the safest, uh, most efficient way to get that slope. What's a safe slope, right? So a lot plays into that. A big one is seat time. You have to have seat time to know how safe, to know how comfortable you are on a slope, right? So that being said, um, you as an operator, you have to use your best judgment when it comes time to determine how safe the situation is, right? So all ties back into experience, all ties back into training and what it really boils down. Just again, starting from the top down, uh, keeping a windrow on the low side of you um, in case you ever do start to slide or the machine gets tippy. Keeping that windrow there will help you uh, avoid those situations. That being said, for you newer guys or newer operators that haven't been around that much, um, one good get it out, but if it starts to slide and you're getting a little tippy, the best thing to do, lower or raise your blade, kind of get rid of that material so you start tracking up on top of it, and turn downhill. So anytime you can do that to get out of one of those situations, um, that's about the best thing you can do to, to avoid tipping the machine over. And again, that goes back to reaction time, goes back to training, goes back to experience. Um, but side sloping, keeping that wind rope earlier about undercarriage wear. So when you're finishing a slope one direction all day, what, what do you think that's doing uh, to your undercarriage? It's wearing one side of it out real hard, right? So anytime you have the opportunity to turn around and try to keep things even, um, keeping that undercarriage wear even um, is always a good habit before we go is uh, slope assist. So this is kind of a cool feature um, in the cab on the display screen here hit our menu button jump right to slope assist it brings this screen up here right so you can say our main fall we're roughly one percent that's good so what main fall is is this the slope the machines the direction the, the slope this is telling me my main fall my blade is at zero almost zero percent so whenever I move over to my cross slope so this on the right hand side here that's our blade slope or our cross slope so that's saying on this slope that we're sitting on right now that's about 25 percent and what that is is side to side and it's not the machine it's what the blade is at so the machine's going to follow the blade so wherever i move that blade it's going to give me those readings of that percent slope is i can use my auto controls so once i get that set i can press that in auto and it's going to automatically control my blade to those two values um, that are in that black box so some cool things about changing these. I pretty much just put my blade wherever I want it and I can match that slope there and I can adjust my cross slope, try to get it back to 25, get as close as we were and I can match that slope. And then I can also find percent. So now whenever I hit autos, it's gonna drive that to 25 and then that's running 5.6. So we'll change that one a little bit, we'll raise up We'll get about one and a half. We'll mark it, increase it, and we're good to go there. So now anytime I hit my autos, my blade is going to drive to those values that are in the, the recall box. Another thing about slope assist is anytime I raise or lower the joystick or I give any joystick commands um, whatsoever, it automatically lets me as operator take control over that system while it stays in autos. So I'll back up here, I'll turn my autos on, and you can see it drives the value, but me as an operator, and just use this as reference, but my cross slope is usually always spot on. So for me, it's easier to run main fall manually, but as soon as I move that, it's going to maintain it at whatever slope I put it at, and, and I can let go of the joystick. is what this is based off of is the bottom of your track pads not the grousers the pads so if there's any wear or you're in hard material or soft material that value is going to change so you're always going to have to adjust material you're in and also based on grouser wear so that's one thing to always keep in mind if you're running if you're saying it's one percent mainfall you always have to tell yourself or ask yourself how am i sitting on the material what kind of material am i in so those are some good key factors on maintaining your, your main fall. So cross slope. 
I think it's 1% for every 100 feet. That's pretty good. Um, so that's a couple things about cross slope. Nathan, did I miss anything? No, I think you covered working a side slope. You know, there's so many different variables that we can have in, in the, that degree of an angle that that machine can work on, whether it be underfoot conditions, operator skill, uh, even the way the, the tractor's been equipped. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different variables. And then when it comes to the slope assist, you know, there was a lot of information there. I encourage everyone online, if they have some more questions on uh, slope assist, to go to Cat Products or on our uh, Facebook page, or excuse me, our YouTube page. And we have a whole bunch of videos on that, as well as some of the other technology that we're going to be discussing today. So with that, we're going to go back to Keith Lilly in the 320. And he's going to talk a little bit about some of the, the uh, efficiencies, best practices that we have when we're working, you know, digging a trench. And then also some of the technology that and the operator can use there. Sure, Nathan. So what I've done here is I've kind of started a little trench. So say we're out on a job site uh, and we just need to basically kind of trim my grade. With the technology we have on this machine, all I would have to do is just hit a button and it'll bench for me and put my offset in. So once I do that and I'm ready to go, I know how deep I have to go. So some of my efficiencies, like we talked about when we were bench loading, um, so what I want to do is I want to take, uh, you, you kind of taste a little bit to figure out how much material you want to take. Depends on how hard it is. How and we want to set up with our stick at our 75 to 90 with our 30 degree bucket. And you can see just in that short of that short of a pole, I have a full bucket. And like I say, if you guys notice this material, it, it is packed. It is very hard. So it's kind of rough uh, digging through. But, you know, just a simple pole to stick. And like I say, we're already ready to go. So... Get a couple buckets here, and my uh, screens let me know that I'm getting down close to gray. What I want to kind of touch is it's down like this and side sweeping material. That's one thing that's kind of a no no. These pins on our machines are not made for that. So it's better to get yourself just where you're into reach, slide your bucket, bring it right to the end of the hole. A lot more efficient, it's a lot quicker, and it's a lot easier on, our, on the machines and the pins. So pin wear, stick wear, boom wear, everything. They're really not made for side loads. It's more for uh, front to back. So once I get my, uh, you know I'm down three and a half. So once I get down to grade, you can see my monitor. It went green to zero, so then I want to make my pull. Try and keep it as close as I can. A little hard spot. Dig my material once I've got it. So there's two ways we can maintain this grade. So I know that I have this little hard spot I need to go through. Get it. Once we get it cut out, not a big deal. So I can do one of two things. Either I can come up here and re-zero. Or I don't know if you can see my screen or not. Jeff's got it on. But right here where I'm cut point or 3.5. So what I would do is I would change that to zero. Which we have set ones in here. So I just set it to zero. And I would reach out and touch the floor of my trench. Because now I already know that I've already got my three and a half foot cut. So now I go to zero. So once I've went to zero, I can hit my button on my stick. That re-zeroes it. Now I know I'm back on grade. So now I can maintain this uh, for infinity if you want. Um, I can I can adjust my percentage on cross slope and I can adjust my percentage on level main fall. One other quick thing we have on this uh, is our e fences. So e fences, um, I can turn my floor on on my e fence, and what that'll allow me to do is oh that's the wall. Hit the floor. What that allows me to do is say okay it will I cannot go any deeper than this. So once I've done that, um, it's on, so now it won't let me go any deeper, uh, so I won't hit a gas line or anything like that. So some quick stuff on that, I can set the floor, the ceiling, the walls, so outlines, any of that stuff. Um, we can. I don't have to worry about hitting uh, power lines, overhead lines, um, anything to that nature. All right. Well, thank you for that, Keith. Yeah, it's it's pretty neat. Some of the stuff that we can do on there, as far as you know, setting 
you know, ethens for the, the ceiling walls, side by, you know, for swing, you know, working in an intersection or next to a roadway. So a lot of, a lot of neat technology on there as well. A bit on uh, the, the medium size excavator, but we're going to bring it down in size and, and talk a little bit about this 302 and the, the mini excavators and some of the technology and some of the features that have come out in this new next gen uh, mini excavator. So first off, small size you can fit a decent amount uh, of people and you can fit a fairly good sized person in there John's nice and tall he fits in there nice and comfortably so this is this right here I'm moving the machine with the joystick I can turn left turn right go forward back up this is pretty nice especially for us smaller fellas that don't really like to use these things because it gets kind of cramped up in here a little bit right so simple press of the yellow button I turn it on or I turn it off, now I got full full use of my boom bucket and stick. I turn it on, now I can move the machine down here at the bottom of the screen and just hit OK. And now whenever any time I have stick steer on, um, it's in blade mode where my right joystick actually runs the blade up and down. So if I'm back filling, it's a lot more comfortable, um, a lot more easier to, to, to use the blade function with your right joystick, right? Then they also have excavator mode. so. I'll flip it over and that's on our right stick of our boom bucket and stick, right? So you have all those, still have all those stick um, boom and bucket commands right there on the right hand joystick. And with the left hand joystick, now that that is your your drive stick, right? So there's a roller on this joystick that allows me to swing the swing the house. So I still have all those back filling. Press the shortcut, takes me right back to. Uh, right back to blade mode where if I'm back filling a trench I can just right hand joystick blade up and down. One more thing I'll show you is uh, track gauge. So right now we're at a wider stance, right? Better stability. Um, now simply just lift the machine up. If I got a gate or something I need to go through, uh, your blade control and it'll run those tracks in and out. So tighter, narrow places you need to get into. Pretty simple to do. Um, again, just one of those one of those features that's pretty handy on these machines. It's almost like a Swiss Army knife, Nathan. Yeah, it definitely is, John. So with that that mini excavator, you know, just to recap, John can operate that thing with his left, uh, you know, the boom, the stick, and the bucket on there. So it gives a lot of versatility on that machine. So